Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit be our guide, teach us today. Uh, Lord, uh, we ask your blessing on any who listen uh, to these messages. Lord, I thank you for your blessing in my life. I just uh, praise you for who you are, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We just finished up the Gospel of Matthew. Now, each Gospel tells us something different about Jesus. We understand with the Gospel of Matthew that it was presenting Jesus as the King. He offered himself uh, as the King, and uh, he offered himself to rule and reign uh, for the people of Israel, but they rejected him. The leaders of Israel rejected him. Uh, and at the end of Matthew, it's interesting uh, that uh it doesn't speak about the ascension of Jesus. And uh, the last act is still having Jesus here on earth. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't ascend. We understand from other scripture that he ascended uh, back to heaven. But he, uh, I believe the reason it doesn't talk about his ascension is because it's still showing that he is the king of the earth. And it uh, clearly presented that through all of Matthew. Now, Acts as we start uh, the book of Acts, Acts uh, really, uh, some people have called it the fifth gospel, uh, and it, uh, I won't necessarily use that uh, phraseology, but uh, Acts is a transitional book, and we want to understand that Acts is uh, a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament or the church age. Uh, so in the Gospels, really, uh, most of the Gospels is still in the Old Testament, even though it is part of the New Testament. Uh, but it's under the Old Testament law in that sense. Uh, the Bible says that the death of the testator is required uh, for us to enter into the New Testament. So uh, when Christ died and rose again, uh, that's where we really began the New Testament, but we had to transition in terms of uh, time. We ourselves didn't, we're in the church age, but we had to transition uh, as far as the world goes from the Old Testament time to the New Testament time. And that's what Acts does for us. Uh, so you wanna be very careful in churches in taking the book of Acts and applying uh, things that happen in the book, book of Acts to the church age. For instance, a lot of churches, I believe, are uh, confused as they uh, think that speaking in tongues is still for this time. I'll just make a quick mention of that. There's, uh, if you study church history, there's no mention of the use of speaking in tongues after about 90 AD. 96 AD, roughly in that time frame, when the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, so uh, to use the book of Acts to justify speaking in tongues, we'll talk about that when we get to it, but we don't want to use those things in churches. It causes confusion and uh, cause, causes division, and we want to be united in terms of Christ. Now, of course, some people will use unity uh, that uh, we don't want to be united in false doctrine. So what we always want to have is we want to have the apostles doctrine, what was taught to the apostles, uh, what was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ, as we talked about that. Uh, and we'll discuss that a little bit today. But let's remember, uh, Acts is a transitional book. So it's not one where we're going to get doctrine uh, for things of the church uh, to apply, uh, to use in churches for the most part. Okay. Doesn't mean we're not going to teach the book of Acts in church. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. So Acts chapter one, verse one, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now who Theophilus is, we don't, uh, necessarily know. Um, but what Theophilus means is, uh, one loved of God. Theo means God. Uh, uh, the phileo love is a love of God. So Theophilus is uh, loved of God, one loved of God. So we can take this book and understand uh, that God loves us and wants us to learn from it. 
Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus was seen by many people uh, for forty days, and... Um, there are those that have tried to dispute the resurrection of Christ, and anyone who studied it historically has found out that Jesus Christ, he was a real person. He walked this earth, he was crucified, and he did rise again. People have tried uh, over the years to refute that and have ended up becoming believers uh, because of that. Uh, Sir William Ramsey was one. Uh, he was a famous archaeologist, and he looked at... Uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and he did not believe Luke could have had those details uh, so accurate, and he realized after he studied uh, the archaeology that Luke, the only way he was that accurate is because it was the Word of God, and he ended up becoming a believer as a result. Now, Luke is the author of the uh, book of Acts as well. Now, in verse 3, uh, it talks about him being resurrected, showed himself alive after his passion. Well, what was his passion? His passion was to go to the cross. And uh, the last recorded fact of Jesus in Matthew is uh, the resurrection. So we'll see uh, all the recorded facts of the gospel uh, spoken of in Acts uh, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is a really a uh, key chapter. We'll spend a little time in this one. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now see, after he had risen, they asked if, after he was risen, they asked him if he would uh, set up the millennial kingdom. And here was his answer, verse 7. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1.8 is a key uh, verse. It talks uh, through Acts uh, 1, five through 8 actually, and even more of this uh, passage. It talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the last recorded act in the Gospel of Luke uh, by Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we see that here. But I'm going to read Acts 1, 8 again. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you. And it says, And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now he's speaking to his disciples here, of course. But I believe there's a direct ap application to us. If we have put our trust in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, and we want to uh, be witnesses to others. And that is witnesses with our lives. It's witnesses with our mouth uh, speaking the word of God. May the Holy Spirit uh, bless you today with this reading. May the Lord bless you. May Jesus Christ, uh, the God and Savior of the universe, uh, 